to the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Educational Concepts in Simulation Education Webinar. I am KT Waxman, and I am the Director of the Master's in Healthcare Simulation Program at the University of San Francisco. And I am currently um, a certified healthcare simulation educator, which is the CHSE that you see. And I'm also the director of the California Simulation Alliance, which is a group of around 4,000 from around the state of California. And we teach faculty and, um, and educators how to teach simulation to their students and uh, staff. And we offer courses, we have scenarios, and we have a great network uh, built in the state of California. And I'll introduce you now to Marjorie Miller, who will tell you a little bit about herself. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for attending. My name's Marjorie Miller, and um, I'm also a certified health um, excuse, certified healthcare simulation educator. That cheesy word is a little difficult to say. Um, I work with KT in the Masters of Simulation in Healthcare um, course at USF as an adjunct faculty member. I've done some consulting there with um, with, sim with their simulation program. And I'm formerly the director of the simulation program at Cabrillo College in the Santa Cruz area. I, for two, since 2006, I've been involved in simulation and have been and still am the lead faculty for the California Simulation Alliance. So ready to Thank go, you. KT? Thank you, Marjorie. Let's see, I'm just going to go to the next slide here. So what we want to do today um, within this, say, 45-minute webinar um, are these objectives. We want to just talk about the advantages of using simulation, the essential components and teaching methodologies in program education regarding simulation, and discuss the types of simulation and select those that are effective in your practice setting. Compare and contrast simulation technology versus simulation methodology. And then we're going to summarize at the end by some of the international we're seeing in simulation education. So before we get started, I would like to ask you all a favor. If you go to your control panel under the chat function and in the to section where it says all audience, could you just type us one or two words that describes the position that you're in now? That way we can kind of get a sense of who we have in the audience. And I know that we have about 10 people on at this point. Um, we're assuming that you're either someone who is interested in simulation and knows nothing about it, someone who's in simulation but has never had any formal training, a nurse, physician, OTPT pharmacist, technician, and whatever the case may be, this program is designed for you. So while you're doing that, I want to let you know that we're going to provide you with this overview of the foundational concepts today and the underpinnings for the use of simulation as a teaching methodology for professional healthcare education. We will talk about evidence-based standards and the theoretical frameworks related to simulation today. And of course, at the end, we will tell you a little bit about the USF Masters of Healthcare Simulation Program. So we want to start out by just talking a little bit about what is simulation and why do we use it in healthcare. So the definition of simulation, according to the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, is the imitation or representation of one act or system by another. And their website is listed there. And this is the global organization that has um, come together to talk about standardizing the way we do simulation, um, creating a taxonomy around simulation, and they have an annual meeting every year called the International Meeting on Simulation in Healthcare. And Marjorie and I, um, since we've been in simulation since about 2005, 2006, have been attending these meetings for many years. And I know that from my perspective, it was all about simulation 
simulators at the very beginning, and it has evolved into something much more beyond that. And we're going to talk about that today. It's more than just the technology. It's really about the methodology, and we'll say that more than once. So those of you who are interested in technology, this is a wonderful industry for you. And those who aren't so interested in technology, it's also a wonderful industry. So that is their definition. So what exactly is simulation? Simulation is the imitation or representation of one actor system by another. And there are four main purposes. And really, ultimately, in healthcare, the reason we do simulation is to facilitate patient safety. So we look at education, assessment, research, and health system integration. Using simulation for not only educating staff and students on how to assess, how to uh, talk to patients, how to talk to one another, but there's also a research component in um, that a lot of research going on today that looks at why simulation makes a difference and why it's better to use simulation than working on real patients or animals. Um, you'll see a movement recently into health system integration where simulation is used for new hospitals, new uh, nursing units, new buildings, new um, organizations, large organizations to actually use simulated patients and simulated um, staff actors, if you will, to, to look at admitting a patient, moving them through the hospital, um, into the elevator, up to the ward, and simulation is really, really good for this. You don't have any harm to any patients or staff, and you can make um, a lot of changes through simulation before you actually knock down walls or put policies into place. You can use simulation for health system integration. So some of the key points, um, according to um, GABA and Durham and Alden, are that simulation is a teaching strategy. It is a methodology. It is not just a technology. And it's used to develop, refine, and apply KSAs, which are knowledge, skills, and attitudes. They're realistic. Simulations can be very realistic, lifelike, very participative, and very, very interactive. And so simulations, and we'll talk about developing simulations on another webinar, but creating these um, simulations can be for one person or for a group of people, and so they're very, very interactive. Some of the key points according to the Clinical Simulation in Nursing, which is the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, and for those of you on the phone that are uh, registered nurses or licensed nurses, might want to look into this organization. It's inaxel.org, and they have actually created standards in which to write curriculum um, on their standards of practice, their standards for um, just about everything that we're talking about today. And it's a wonderful uh, wealth of information. And those standards are actually free if you go onto their website. So they say that the goal really is to support progression from novice to expert. So people coming into a situation that don't have any experience, for instance, a student who is learning how to be a professional, or perhaps a new grad who's learning how to be a fully functional team member. So simulation can support that growth from novice to expert. It can also promote trust and foster learning. It's very experiential. It's based on adult learning theory. And um, the students and staff that have um, gone through simulations often report that they felt really good about the simulation that they experienced and that was, they were able to get a better sense of who their coworkers were and what their roles were in the, in the process. And a facilitator, and that's a key per, uh, person in simulation, is actually responsible for creating an atmosphere for open sharing of experience. So what we found in simulation and um, one of the most important parts of doing a simulation is the after the simulation when we debrief. And that role facilitator can be a faculty member, 
it can be a director, it can be an educator, but there's certain skills that go into being a facilitator to create an atmosphere that feels safe and that is open for sharing of experiences amongst the learners. The AHRQ, which is Association of Health, Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, really is focused on um, safety and patient safety. And they, they look at simulation as being used with a team versus individual function. We can take a, an individual uh, healthcare pr uh, professional and put them in a simulation to help them learn, or we can take a team of professionals together to help them learn to work better together. Uh, emergencies, anytime there's an emergency, maybe it's in the parking lot, in the lobby, on the unit, in the ICU, the first time you enter into an emergency um, can be a very scary thing. So simulation can be used to rehearse how you're going to function in an emergency situation. We like to focus on the unexpected, and that's what we practice on identifying things that may not happen that you weren't prepared for. Why would we use simulation for those normal things that we see every day? It's really utilized a lot for things that are unexpected or emergencies. And then communication. The Institute of Medicine report that came out in 1999, again in 2001, and most recently, states that the number one reason that er errors occur in healthcare today are because of a breakdown in communication. And so simulation activities, exercises, and scenarios can be utilized to enhance communication among team members. I'm not sure if you on the phone are aware that in nursing school and medical school, oftentimes those students never speak to each other until they get into a hospital. They don't know how to communicate. And so simulation and an interprofessional simulation at that where you take nursing students and medical students together and help them with communication is critical before they get into a hospital together. It's also used in hospital settings for teams of interprofessionals so that they can understand their role and feel comfortable communicating with one another. So there's um, several types of simulation. We've been using that term loosely at this point, and I just want to kind of go over a couple of, of them and so you get a sense of what it's all about. So there's computer-based or virtual reality simulations. And these are very popular. You can get onto a computer and you can see that um, there's avatars, perhaps. Um, you can have a hospital room, a bed, a patient in the bed, and they're all like cartoon characters or avatars. And you can go through a simulation that way. What's really growing in this industry is serious gaming. And for those of you who grew up using video games, you can clearly understand where simulation can go in that space. Um, you can play games and learn at the same time in a simulated environment without ever leaving your office or your home. So that's an up and coming area. A lot of places are using a computer based simulation prior to a real high fidelity simulation. Um, the second is standardized participants which is also known as SPs and these standardized it could be patients, they could be actors are, are real people and they're hired. Many of them are actors, many of them are retired, many of them are theater students, and they come in with, um, and they're prepped uh, to certain diagnoses, what to say, how to feel, what to ask, and our physicians and our nurse practitioners and our students all benefit by participating on being able to do an assessment, talk to these people, before they're a real patient. And those standardized participants actually give feedback to the student. How did they feel when they asked them those questions? What did they miss? What did they not clue in on when they were talking? The third section is task trainers, and these can be very low level or very complex. And an example of a task trainer is an arm that is plastic with a vein in it, and students learn how to start an IV. Or 
they could it could be a, a head with an open mouth and they're learning how to intubate. It could be a chest with a beating heart where they're learning how to listen to the heartbeat. So task trainers are there's a wide variety um, that are used. And then lastly are simulators and they have been called human patient simulators, they're called um, high fidelity simulators and um, they look like real people. They're uh, the size of an actual adult. They breathe, they can cry, they can sweat, they talk, they have breath sounds, bowel sounds, pulses, and they are very expensive. There are different levels of fidelity and fidelity really is the realism. So you can have a very expensive simulator that does all the things I described or you could have a low fidelity simulator that still looks like a person but it may not have bowel sounds or pulses or um, breath sounds. It may just be uh, a, a lower fidelity. And then hybrid is when you take a, a simulator and a person, a standardized participant, and put them together. And an example of that is a woman who's lying in the bed and you're talking and she's pregnant and she's in labor. Below her waist is a task trainer, which is perhaps a pelvis, the baby in, in there, and she's talking and breathing and saying, I'm going to give birth, but she's not actually doing the birth, the task trainer is. So that's an example of hybrid. And there are many ways you can do hybrid. So it's very exciting in um, now with simulation is just growing by leaps and bounds. Some of the settings you're going to see simulation occur are in an actual simulation lab, which is an actual building that has rooms designated for uh, standardized participants and simulators and task trainer, trainers and debriefing. Um, some are large, some are very small, some are five stories high, some are a closet and maybe a classroom. And you're going to see a range of these throughout the country and the world. The second setting is called in situ or in situ, depending on where you live. And in situ means at the bedside or at the unit level. So it's in the place where the incident or dilemma would occur. So instead of participants going to a simulation lab to learn, they would be where they work. And the lab simulation folks go to them. An example of that would be in maybe in an ICU, an intensive care unit, you could have a mannequin, which is a simulator, in a bed in the ICU, and you could call a code blue, which means they're going into cardiac arrest, and the staff come into that room, realize it's not a real patient, but they have to treat it like that and go through the emergency with a mannequin. That would be considered in situ. And then the last one is uh, mobile, and that's when big vans or buses come and are, are equipped with mannequins and staff, and I've seen ambulances con um, converted to be mobile sim labs, and we go to the place and help do simulations with those who don't have a sim lab or don't have a mannequin. So that is the gamut of simulation at this point. So simulators, as I said, are also called mannequins. And you can see a few pictures here. Of, there's a pregnant mom on your left. There's a, a simulator at the bottom where they're going to be starting CPR. And then on the right, you can see it looks like, uh, uh, who knows what that is, it looks like emesis. And that is considered moulage. And moulage, for those of you who are technicians or, or want to be technicians or faculty, you can actually put makeup and create a sense of realism by um, doing what's called moulage. It could look like blood or vomit or other. And so some technicians really, really get, get into the moulage piece. When they're asked to set up a room, they put the wig on the patient, sunglasses, tattoos, whatever the case may be. So those are some um, samples of mannequins. And then I think that it's important to note that 
while stimulation isn't just for medical doctors or nursing students, it is for the interprofessionals and everyone that works in the hospital or the healthcare industry. We've got, as you can see, doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and family members all involved in these simulations. And this is definitely the wave of the future. You're going to see a change in curriculum in both the nursing schools of nursing, medicine, physical therapy, occupational speech, respiratory, podiatry, even veterinary science. So why, why do we use it? What is it all about and why is it so popular? Well, we want to decrease any human error. We want to have our students or our learners make mistakes if they're going to make a mistake in a controlled, safe environment. Wouldn't you rather have someone give the wrong medication to a mannequin than a real person? When you look at pilots and pilots that have flown planes for years, they would never be allowed to fly a plane had they not gone through simulation training for multiple hours of time. This is not the case in healthcare, which many of us assumed it was. As a patient, you assume that that person taking care of you has all the training that they need. And we are in this industry trying to change that, trying to require clinicians to have simulation training before they touch a patient so as not to have any possibility of error. It also increases a learner's decision-making skill development. So we want them to process situations in simulation rather than at the bedside once they get into the hospital. And it helps them create those skills. Um, we use simulation to practice skills in a controlled environment. And it's a very controlled in simulation. We don't, um, most simulations are say 15 to 20 minutes long depending on the scenario. And a little uh, debriefing after that which is um, mostly twice as long as a sim. So we're talking about an hour of time in a controlled environment with a guaranteed clinical experience. Whereas a medical student or a nursing student out in the hospital may hope to see a certain diagnosis or episode occur and they may not see that because the patient was discharged or there was activity on the unit. But in simulation, we can make it happen. Stimulation also facilitates on-demand access to patients so we can guarantee a clinical experience. We allow for mistakes, and after the mistake is made, we talk about it, we learn from it, and others that were involved learn well. And it also supports learners to analyze their own and their team performance and to identify any performance gaps. So really focused on team building and interprofessional skills. So the components of simulation include the following, and each of these um, are pretty complex, but this is a very high level so that you can understand the connection to um, simulation to education. So you have to have a plan before you do a sim, and that includes your pre-scenario learning activities, if any, which could include a computer-based um, scenario, a pre-briefing, which goes over expectations, confidentiality, debriefing, guidelines, and orientation to the mannequin or the room or the environment. And then the scenario, which is crafted very carefully, uh, is a, you have assigned roles. You understand what that experience is going to be. We have scripted actors or standardized participants the interprofessional team, and the case flow. So all of, there's a lot com going on in a scenario to develop a scenario, and we actually are going to do a webinar on this topic later on. Um, debriefing is, follows scenario de the scenario itself, and it's facilitated reflective thinking session. There may be video involved, and the video would be reviewed with the participants in a very comfortable, non-threatening environment. And then lastly is the evaluation, which can be two-pronged. You evaluate the simulation itself and evaluate and assess the learning that occurred with the participant. So 
I will conclude my section, this first section, with this slide. Even though we've talked about the technology, and the technology is important, it's really about the methodology. And that's one thing that we focus on in our program is the pedagogy and the andragogy, if you will, of simulation related to educational frameworks. And that would be considered the methodology. So well, that's a segue into our next section, educational frameworks. And I'll turn it over to Marjorie Miller. Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. OK, I'm getting some feedback here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK. OK, so we've taken a look at simulation in terms of what it is, why do we use it, and now we're going to look at the reasons why simulation actually works. So there's a number of current um, theoretical frameworks. Uh, OK. Um, Excuse me. Uh, hold hold on just one moment, please. Audrey, I'll do, I'll advance the slides. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's a number of current theoretical frameworks that are based in cognitive science that support the benefits of simulation-based learning. These four frameworks listed above: constructivism, experiential, adult learning, and reflective practice will be highlighted on the following slides. But the overarching framework is that the theory of constructivism is the one on which all the other frameworks are based. Now, you might wonder why this is important, but what I'll attempt to do, I'm not quite there yet, KT, what I'll attempt to do is um, uh, describe what it is, how the learning occurs, and what the instructor behaviors are that facilitate that learning practice. We move to the next one. Okay. Thank you. So constructivism is actually an active process of constructing meaning. It's how people make sense of their experience. Learning occurs when a situation triggers a relevant part of the learner's frame of reference, or another term that's used a lot in the simulation literature is um, frame of reference or mental model. And that provokes the construction of a new expanded model. Some of the helpful teacher behaviors to support this type of learning are to scaffold learning by providing support such as resources, compelling tasks, templates and guides, and support in developing both cognitive and social skills because they are going to be working as a team and they are going to be interacting with human beings and families. So the compelling situations are those that allow for inquiry and discovery. Other teacher behaviors include modeling, giving advice, providing coaching. These supports are gradually taken away, so those scaffolds are gradually taken away as the learner achieves a higher level. For example, the more novice the learner, the more obvious the cues are going to be given during the simulation. But the more advanced the learner, the more subtle the cues and the time is given for them to figure it out. Next slide, please. Next slide, Katie. OK. So rooted in constructivism and evident in adult learning theory, the theorists described here include Kolb, the humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers, and the nursing theorist um, Patricia Benner. So in 1984, David Kolb expanded the seminal work of Dewey, Lewin, and Piaget, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, it posited that in order for learning to occur, the adult learner needs to experience a situation, needs to reflect on that experience, needs to abstract a new mental model, and needs to test the new mental model. So the way we look at that in simulation is that they experience the situation through a concrete experience or through a scenario. They reflect on that scenario in the debriefing session immediately afterwards and pull the learning out at that time. They abstract a new mental model or they expand a mental model in the debriefing period and then they transfer it to the clinical setting. So they uh, test the new mental model in the transfer to the clinical setting. Carl Rogers is a humanistic psychologist and he envisions learning as equivalent to personal change and growth. Learning is facilitated when the teacher creates a positive climate, clarifies the purpose, 
offers those resources, and get this one, balances the intellectual and the emotional. So not only the knowledge and the skills, but also the attitudes. And I think he wrote this in 1963. They share personal thoughts without and feelings without taking over the responsibility for the learning. And this comes, I guess it was 1969, sorry. Patricia Banner, the nurse educator that we've all heard about and the one that developed the novice to expert model, describes the learning process as occurring when the learner is open to having their expectations and their previous beliefs refined, challenged, or disconfirmed. A spirit of inquiry supports this, supports this process. So one being curious about the learning is really helpful. And when uh, KT was talking earlier about the Anaxal standards, this is right in line with them. So if you create an environment that is open and trusting, then that learner is going to be able to have their expectations looked at and have, uh, have them examined and either challenged or disconfirmed. Next slide, please. The experiential learning uh, theory that we highlighted on the previous slide really forms the basis for Knowles' development of adult learning theory. In brief, Knowles disco uh, discovered or studied further how adults learn differently than children. I think this is pretty key because adults need to be involved in the planning and the evaluation of their instruction. They need to experience, including mistakes, and they need to see that that provides the basis for their learning activities. The adults are most interested in learning about subjects that have immediate re relevance to their job or to their personal life. And the adult learning is, I think this is another key thing for those educators in the group, the adult learning is problem-centered rather than content-centered. And as educators, we often say, I don't have enough time to teach the content. And what you really mean is that you don't have enough time to tell the content. Because where it's not the content that the adult is needing to have their learning focused on, they can get the content themselves, and then they can focus on the problem in a simulation. And that's the way they learn. The next slide talks about uh, Schoen's reflective practice. And this another one, uh, Schoen also wrote this several years ago. But what we do is we move from David Kolb's description of how they need to reflect on an experience in order to learn. And that's called reflective observation. Schoen's theory of learning as a reflective practice is the basis of how professionals think in action. Um, we'll talk about that in just a minute. The cultivation of the, of the capacity to reflect in action while doing something and on action after you've done it has become an important feature of professional training programs in many disciplines, and its encouragement is seen as a particularly important aspect of the role of the mentor in beginning professions. Then, uh, thinking in action I almost forgot Benner there, sorry. Thinking in action is actually the hallmark of Benner's expert clinician who applies evidence-based practice at the bedside. And in our next slide, we're going to just briefly skim over a couple of other uh, frameworks. The um, contextual framework, contextualized learning framework really talks about um, having the experience be in a situation that mimics the uh, environment where the work will take place. Situated cognition is another educational framework that really talks about situational awareness, and a lot of us probably have, have looked at it in that, those terms. So doing that 60-second that, uh, situational um, environmental assessment as you walk into the room and teaching beginning learners how to do that is really the, the um, development of situated cognition. The next two, uh, novice to expert and deliberate practice, we'll look at the next two slides. So when we look at um, novice to expert with Benner, Benner, she's a nursing theorist who explains and expands the description of experiential learning. 
when she describes it as clinical learning that is accomplished, as we said before, by having one's expe expectations refined, challenged, or disconfirmed by the unfolding events. This process is how the novice, who is rule-driven and bound by concrete thinking, moves along the continuum to the expert, who is able to reflect in action or think on their feet to apply evidence-based practice at the bedside. Experiential learning is apparent in every situation where one's preconceptions, again, are challenged, clinical inquiry is demonstrated, and self-reflection is required. So this is very important for us to include when we're writing our scenarios and to highlight when we're doing the debriefing following that. So it's essential that, as simulation educators, we do provide simulations that are challenging but not overwhelming. So aligning them with the curriculum, aligning them with pre-scenario activities so learners are prepared to do their best in the simulation is really important, and that's providing the resources. We're providing resources, not just a textbook, but the resources are provided with intentionality. So the learners demonstrate the clinical inquiry, decision-making, and the ability to reflect so that they can examine any performance gaps and improve. The final education theory that we're going to be discussing is Erickson's deliberate practice. He developed this in 1993 and it's been expanded and this is the one that you've probably heard about where he says that it takes over 10 years to achieve expert status and then only with deliberate practice. And that's defined as effortful activities designed to optimize improvement. He further states that to foster this transition to expert status, training is designed and arranged by teachers and coaches, excuse me, defined and arranged by teachers and coaches, it's focused on improving particular tasks. So where we see this is in a skills lab. So conditions where practice is uniformly associated with improved performance include the ones listed above, where there are well-defined goals for whatever task is provided, that the individual is internally motivated to improve, so it's relevant to their work situation and they want to improve. The individual is provided with immediate and diagnostic feedback, so immediate and very specific feedback. This is one where the learner will be interrupted while conducting the task if they make a mistake. We'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, ample opportunities for repetition need to be um, afforded with gradual refinements in the, the learner's, um, learner's performance. So, so think about someone trying to um, insert a central venous access device into um, a patient that they're not going to get that the first time. So you want to have ample opportunities for repetition and you do want to um, immediately stop them if they're on the wrong track. And this is very different than what we would do in a uh, full-blown high fidelity simulation. The last one is very interesting, I thought, that individual must be pushed beyond their current comfort level. And the effort that we're putting together in that simulation requires their full concentration to achieve effect. So therefore, this cannot be going on while, while there are multiple activities going on in the same simulation area or in the same skills lab. What Erickson found in his um, uh, research is that it takes about 10,000 hours of accumulated experience in order to reach expert status. And as a mature um, professional, I need, I loved this little comment that he made, that the age-related decreases in performance appeared to result primarily from reductions of regular deliberate practice rather than the direct consequences of aging. Now there's one other note that I want to make. I, I don't know who our audience is, and so I'm just going to assume um, that some of you are educators that are performing simulation or conducting simulation in um, uh, an academic environment. 
So it should be noted here that Erickson is describing the process of becoming expert at a specific task. With regards to the giving of immediate feedback, we believe that the place for that is after the simulation in the debriefing sessions, with the learner and the peer group analyzing the situation and performance. We're not suggesting stopping the simulation to give immediate specific feedback, as this interferes with learner engagement and also with the ability to suspend disbelief. However, it is appropriate to stop a learner performing a skill in the skills lab and give immediate specific feedback so they don't imprint the wrong performance. In summary, simulation is a constructivistic, experiential learning strategy focusing on the adult practitioner. As such, simulation programs are designed with intentionality and an andragogical rather than a pedagogical approach. The andragogical approach is in concert with the adult learner's need to play an active, purposeful role in developing the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that will facilitate their progress. That progress we're talking about is along the continuum from novice to expert as they become efficient um, healthcare practitioners. So that's the final part about why simulation works and what the underpinnings, theoretical underpinnings are for what we do in simulation. And now um, KT is going to speak more about whether or not simulation is here to stay. And I know the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. So what is simulation? We learned about that. What is the educational basis of simulation? And now the question is, where is it going? Is it here to stay? I'm going to just go through a few slides rather quickly um, on simulation in California because we have access to that data through the California Simulation Alliance. And we've done some recent surveys. And ba basically, 98% of all schools of nursing and medicine are using simulation in California and 87% of hospitals and health systems. And that was based on four surveys in 09, 11, 13, and 15. <clears throat> and here's what it showed. The types of students that are benefiting from simulation are primarily RN um, and LVN, advanced practice nursing, EMTs, respiratory care practitioners, new grads, and med medical students and pharmacy students. We asked the schools how they utilize simulation as a teaching method, and most of them are using high-fidelity mannequins. Well, in California, most schools have high-fidelity mannequins and then created a program around those mannequins because they purchased those back in 2006, 7, and 8, and then a program was developed around that. What we've learned from that experience is that it's better to build a program and have a plan first rather than buy the simulator first. Because as we talked about earlier, there are many types of simulation from low to high fidelity. And once you figure out who your learners are and what you're going to do with simulation, then you can best purchase the right equipment. And then we asked hospitals, how do they use simulation as a teaching methodology? And they also use high fidelity simulation and some mid-level and they also are using some standardized patients and role play, computer, and virtual training. Why are schools using it? 98% um, said development of clinical judgment, support and anchor the application of theory, which Marjorie talked about, and it always needs to be tied to the course objectives, and so that is being utilized at 86%. Communication, uh, development of QSIN, which is uh, quality, safety, education for nursing competencies. And um, many times they're using simulation to uh, gain a clinical experience because clinical experiences in hospitals are decreasing. Hospitals are using it for uncommon clinical experiences, like we talked about earlier, those low volume, high risk events, clinical judgment, and communication. And I want to point out here that the National Council on State Boards of Nursing 
recently um, completed a research study over the last few years and they took 10 schools from around the country and in their first year of the study they introduced 10 percent of simulation in lieu of clinical hours the second year 25 percent and in the third year 50 percent simulation so instead of going to the hospital for training or a clinic for training they went into the sim lab and had simulation at 50 percent of the time and the results of that survey were remarkable the outcome showed that there was no difference in NCLEX scores and NCLEX is the national exam that nurses need to take in order to become licensed. So no difference in scores on that with simulation or clinical experience. And they also showed that for every two hours of the clinical experience, you can get that in one hour of simulation. Last thing they learned was that it's very important to train faculty, which is really what our program is all about. So this is a seminal work. It's very important and it's a national study. So is it here to stay? Well, with no difference in outcomes, we would hope that simulation would be adopted in all schools around the country. We also know that research has shown that hospitals that have used simulation to identify early signs of sepsis that their sepsis rates have decreased or been eliminated completely through the use of simulation training. Transfers to the intensive care unit have decreased when simulation is being utilized in uh, med surge units and teamwork has been enhanced and these are just a few of multiple studies, uh, research studies on simulation and how it has made a difference. We really feel that Faculty development is critical for the success of a simulation program and that faculty need to have the skills needed to teach and run simulation programs. We want them to be focused on the methodology grounded in adult learning theory rather than just receiving a simulator and trying to create a program. It really needs to be grounded in adult learning theory. And for accreditation and certification, which is a national movement to have your sim lab accredited or um, your individual self certified, it um, is, is critical to have faculty development. It also ensures that faculty have the necessary skills and we find that it's often not budgeted for, it's often overlooked. So last, just to wind up here, some strategies to build a successful program including having a plan around that, having the right funding, determining what your objectives are, aligning with the organizational objectives, buying any equipment that's needed, continued faculty development, which could be um, cheesy prep, courses or masters in simulation, solid policies and procedures, and thinking beyond the lab itself. Some of the things we're seeing in around the country are these the inter in, in professional education, standardized participants, the leveling of technology, really looking at what your technology needs are uh, rather than buy 37 high fidelity simulators, integrating using simulation for systems integration, the mobile sim we talked about, the simulation lab or the center identified as a clinical site rather than the students going to the hospital, and certification and accreditation. Here are some resources that you might be interested in if you want to look online for um, validation about simulation or get more information. I talked about the Simu Society for Simulation and Healthcare, the International Nursing Society for Simulation, the NLN, the QSIN, and the CSA websites are also valuable resources. And you can just Google any of these for their um, website. So what, are you interested in simulation as a career? What, what's out there in terms of um, opportunities? Well, a faculty person who is currently a faculty could move into simulation and be a simulation faculty. You could become a simulation technician and we need a lot of simulation technicians. There's research out there that shows that one of the best practice models out there 
is to have a simulation technician help the faculty. Many faculty are not technically savvy, and we need technicians to help us with those, those pieces of equipment, those expensive equipments, audiovisual, etc. There are co simulation coordinator positions that are being created that run labs that coordinate programs. There are directors in a bigger organization. You might have a director of simulation that oversees a coordinator, a tech, and a faculty. And there are a lot of researchers out there that are focused on simulation. So lots of opportunity all over the world for simulation. So lastly, our program. What does it include? It's a 30-unit master's program. It's a non-clinical degree. This master's degree is really an education degree. It sits in the School of Nursing and Health Professions because this is a health profession degree, but it is not a clinical degree. Those 540 hours of practicum that we embed into the curriculum are done at a simulation center, simulation lab, hospital, school site that has simulation. And your practicum hours are designed around what you want to do individually with your final project. It could be clinical, it could be operational, it could be technical. It's an online program, and that's, I would say, 90% online because we have one conference per semester on campus in San Francisco. So we don't, re it's not mandatory. We want you to come. You're on your own for your housing and your transportation. It's going to be a two to two and a half day conference where we do a synthesis of what we learned during the semester. We'll have guest speakers. We'll have time to talk about your practicum. And if you can't attend in person, we will uh, provide an avenue for you to Zoom in uh, via the internet. We prepare students to become professional simulationists, which is either hands-on simulationists or behind the scenes. You need a bachelor's degree with a 3.0 GPA to get into the program, but you don't need any experience. Our current cohort includes a physician, emergency room physician, a registered nurse. We've got a couple of, of non-clinical people that started in this program because they really were interested in the field, and they both now have jobs in simulation centers. Our next group begins January 2016. I think the actual date is the 25th of January. We will go live with the online class. We would have an online orientation the week before. So we're currently accepting applications for January. And at this point, I would like to open up the floor for questions. You can either send us a chat on questions or raise your hand. Oh, unmuted. Just received a question from someone. Oh, who's that? Marjorie? It's Jennifer. I just um, unmuted, and that one of the questions that's come up a couple of times is um, having access to the webinar once once it's over. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, the record it is being recorded, and the webinar will be emailed to all the participants, just so everybody knows. Oh, good. Thank you. And then I believe we're going to post it in a few days on our website for those who didn't attend. They can listen to it. I'm so one of the questions that I had received from a participant was, um, I don't have any clinical experience. I'm working in a non-clinical environment. Do you think I can do this? And my answer would be, absolutely. As I mentioned, we have two non-clinicians that learned so much in the first two semesters that they applied for jobs and um, are both working full-time in simulation right now. So if, if you're interested at all in a very exciting career, 
uh, this would be something that I would consider and enforce the masters to get a master's degree in an industry that's growing um, is very appealing. Any, any other questions? Um, I show a couple other questions, um, KT. Um, mm -hmm. One person asked how many classes um, will they need to take each semester? So that's a good question. It, it is designed to be completed in four semesters, and to complete it in four semesters, you would need to take two classes a semester with practicum. So you'd need to get your hours in a site and take the two classes online to get out in four semesters. However, if you don't need to get out in four semesters, you can take one course at a time. But there's no guarantee that the course that you need is going to be offered the next semester. So um, until we um, have at least you know 20 students in the program, we're only going to offer them once a semester for the four and then repeat them. So you can take it over a couple of years, but it's better to take it in four semesters, then that would be two courses per semester. And then another question is, is there any benefit to acquiring the CHSE or CHSOS? Is there any benefit? Absolutely. So you can only uh, re sit for those um, accreditation exams if you have experience. So if you, we prepare you to take those exams. Um, but but they may require two years experience in sim and if you're not doing any sim and you graduate you still need a few more months of experience to apply for those for those exams what we're finding nationally is that is um, for sim labs that are becoming accredited they're requiring their faculty to be cheesy certified or um, CHOS certified uh, to work in that lab and it really enhances your credibility as a simulationist. So our courses throughout our program, we believe are preparatory for those, and we definitely encourage you to sit for those exams. Um, Marjorie reminded me that if you don't have any experience in um, healthcare, that we will be offering um, a couple of suggestions for uh, medical terminology before you start or in conjunction with your first semester because we do throw around a lot of acronyms and we have a different language in healthcare as many of you know and so we need you to be savvy in that arena and there are multiple um, sites that we will send you to to get that medical terminology um, experience. Do we have time for a couple que more questions, KT? Uh, sure, we have two minutes. Okay. Um, so one question is how an individual without a degree um, would be able to get into this type of program. Is that possible? Well, you, the re minimum requirement is a bachelor's degree. So we don't currently have um, an entry-level entry master's program. You do have to have a bachelor's degree. So, you know, I would say that that would be something that you could work towards is get your bachelor's and then come back and apply for this program because we don't have a bridge program at this point, but maybe in the future. Um, another question is, how are the online classes set up? Are there discussion boards? Are they recorded like the webinar? Currently, the online courses are set up in modules and you'll look, you can see your entire semester at a glance of assignments that need to be done, um, discussion boards that need to be completed, uh, Zooms. We do have a couple of uh, synchronous uh, online co um, classes during the semester so that all the students sign in, the faculty, and we do a, a, about an hour long um, synchronous uh, classroom. And but you can you can pretty much go at your own pace and get some of these things done after you know the faculty opens them up because what we don't want to happen is that we open up the whole course and you 
sit in a room for 40 hours and just do a semester's worth of work. Because if you go back to our educational frameworks, you know, from novice to expert and experiential learning, it is a process. We want you to read, digest, report. We'll facilitate the discussion boards. And um, there's usually a paper due with each course, or it might be a course that we, in the curriculum development course that we offer. The deliverable will be to write a, a course, actual course. So we have papers, um, courses. You might have to do a video, a PowerPoint presentation. So there's lots of different uh, methods that we use for learning, to facilitate learning. Um, and another question is if you already have a master's degree, is there any way to combine the coursework with the DMP program? If you have an RN degree with a master's degree, you might want to consider our DNP program and do your DNP project on simulation. We have several students who have done that. You may not need to get another master's. To get a DMP with an emphasis in simulation would be my recommendation. And whoever you are out there, you can contact me separately and we can talk through that. Um, and another, uh, if you have a minute, I've asked about the practicum, if you could explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the practicum is 540 hours total. And so each semester you're doing between 90 and 135 hours of uh, practicum. We help you find a site near where you live. And it could be your own site, your own practicum. Um, it could be done in your own facility. We need a preceptor there or a mentor that's going to understand what your learning objectives are for the practicum and help you meet those. And then we check in with those people a couple of times a semester to ensure that you're on track. At the end of the practicum, we would have a deliverable, and it will be um, related to the topic of the practicum. One practicum is about um, running a simulation lab. One is about space. One is about writing a course. Um, and so those specific objectives would have to be met during the practicum so that when you go into the site, um, you have specific objectives for that semester. And it's easy to do, and we do allow you to double dip. If you're actually working in a simula simulation lab right now and you're doing work, you can take credit for some of that work as well, as long as it's not related to the, what you would have done in a normal day. It's got to be something a little bit above and beyond what you would normally do. And I think that's it for the questions, unless I missed something. Well, thank you, everyone. And we've got our emails here. Let me just pull it up. That's me and Marjorie. And then I think you have um, Tamara and Jen's email as well. Um, I'm sure they'll all be they'll be getting back to you to check in as well. And they can refer any questions directly to myself or Marjorie. And we're happy to answer those because we are so excited about this program and we are just eager to get students enrolled. So thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. So, Jen, yes. I'm going to sign out. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now. Okay, thanks.